So now we are live. We get some folks hopefully joining in. Awesome. Looks like we got some people coming in. Thank you for being here today, folks who are just getting in the room. Uh, we're going to start off in about probably about five minutes, but if you feel comfortable, go ahead and toss in the chat where you're coming in from today, where you're joining in from, what you're doing. Uh, we're super excited to have you here. So uh, let us know what you're up to. I might have said that a little too quick. Ah, we got somebody joining in from Denver. So folks who are just getting on, uh, what I mentioned before was that if you feel comfortable, go ahead and let us know where you're joining in from today um, and just introduce yourself so our panelists can get to know you a little bit. San Diego, Denver, love it. Hi, Allie. Hi, Bernadette. Hi, Melissa. Jumping ahead, jumping again. Mm -hmm. For those who are just getting on, we will be starting in just a few minutes, but I see there's a few people that are already introducing themselves in the chat. We're super excited to have you. London, thank you for joining in from London, Joseph. We're super excited to have you. Allison from New Jersey, excited to have you here too. Also, if um, folks are trying to chat at our panelists, make sure that you switch it from um, panel, all panelists and attendees so you can introduce yourself to everyone, even the other attendees who are joining in today. Hey, John. <laughs> Thanks for introducing yourself in the chat. <laughs> well, I'm going to give it one more minute and then we'll kick things off. Hi, Mike. Thanks for being here. Cool. Well, I'm going to kick things off. Super excited to have everyone here today. So the event that you're joining in on today is called Getting Down to Cannabis Business, Tech and Innovation in Cannabis. So before we kind of get things going, I'm just going to do a quick intro of General Assembly. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm the local, market, local marketing producer for General Assembly Denver. My pronouns are she, her. Um, General Assembly is a global education company, so we focus on helping people find the work that they love through education. So we've got um, a lot of campuses worldwide. Um, I think we have about 30 in the States. Uh, we are just growing and growing. So we do, um, we have actual campus locations. We've got pop-up campuses, micro campuses. So we're just trying to continue to grow our reach. Um, and so what we teach, um, 
we have our software engineering immersive courses. Um, those are 12 week fully immersive courses. We also have 12 week immersive courses in UX design, data science. Uh, we do part time courses in data analytics, digital marketing. Um, and then we also do um, some one off courses. So if you just want to upskill on the weekends, in the evenings, you can do that through GA. So if you're just looking for a little bit of career development, so on and so forth, you can do that. Um, just wanted to mention some upcoming programming that we have if you guys are interested in getting into a couple different workshops. These are some things that we have coming down the pipeline. And then um, before we kind of kick things off, just wanted to give everyone an understanding of how Zoom webinar works. So the Zoom chat is just for interaction with general attendees and for the panelists. You can use the Q&A for actual questions that you have for our speakers and Whitney will be covering that at the end. Um, and then this event is going to be recorded, um, so we'll make sure we send that out. Also, my colleague Emily is going to drop into the chat um, our web captioning feature, so you can use that during this event as well. And I'm actually going to go kick this over to Corey, who's going to introduce our partner, SuperHue. Hi everyone, my name is Karina Sanchez. Um, I also go by Corey. I'm one of the co-founders of SuperHue. We're um, a Chicago-based and women-owned CBD-infused sparkling tonic. Um, we use 50 milligrams of CBD per can um, and only real ingredients in our drinks. So we use um, like real juices, use apple cider vinegar, ginger, turmeric, blue magic, kind of like all the good stuff um, that you could want. Um, and then do I go on the next slide? There you go. Um, as I mentioned, we're Chicago based, we're women owned. Um, we started this company because of what the cannabis and the hemp plants did for our lives, both of our, like our wellness and our social routines. And we just really wanted to put a product out there that um, really stood for what we believed in, which was, you know, letting go of the everyday stressors of life and really just being who you were meant to be. And, and um, we think CBD and especially like our product will help you do that. Um, and then, like I mentioned, every can has 50 milligrams of CBD. Currently they have no THC in there for those of you that are still wary about um, you're experimenting with THC, um, they're vegan and just really great for you. And this is just like a rundown of the three flavors that we have. Um, so part of this panel, uh, we're gonna be doing a giveaway. So it's gonna be pretty fun if you can post uh, you watching this, um, you know, your screen, you yourself, um, and tag everyone. I think on the next slide should be everyone that you need to tag. Um, and we will an announce the winner before the weekend. Uh, so I'll pass it back to Hannah. Thank you. So everyone take a moment, uh, get all these handles so you can win a pack, a three pack of this. Um, there'll be two, three packs that are going out. So very excited about this. Um, I'll give everyone a second, take a screenshot. Um, and so you have a good chance to win. We're excited to have you here. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna actually pass this over to Whitney. Whitney, you can kick off intros and um, I'm gonna go off screen. Great, <laughs> forgot to unmute myself. Um, hi everyone, I'm Whitney, AKA, Sunny Days on Instagram. I also am the co-founder of OK OK Creative. Um, and I'm gonna be moderating this panel today. Um, so I'll just run through all of these amazing human beings real quick. Um, first up, we have John Shute. He is the CEO of Puff Creative and also a friend of mine. Love, love John, he's a great guy. Um, he just knows everyone. He's Good person to know in the industry. Um, and then we have Shada, and she is the co founder of Restart CBD. Um, we have Celia Daly, Director of Development and Operations for Canopy Boulder. And then Corey, who we just met, the co founder of SuperHue. So, um, just 
just to, to kick this off, I would love to hear more about each of your backgrounds, kind of uh, what you did before the cannabis industry, how you were attracted to the cannabis industry, and what ultimately led you to start your businesses. Um, Shada, do you want to go first? I will go first. So hello, everybody. My name is Shada Tarabi. I am here in Austin, Texas, a non-adult use state, but CBD is very much legal. And so I operate Restart CBD. We have a brick and mortar CBD dispensary in Austin, as well as operate an e-commerce brand. I own the business with my sister. So we are women owned. We are born and raised in Austin. So we're local owned, but we do ship nationwide, just having an e-commerce brand. And we've been running the business for two years. And I got into CBD in particular after a very gnarly car accident. I was hit by a vehicle as a pedestrian in 2015 and fractured my pelvis in two places and went through traditional recovery methods, steroid injections, uh, pain medications, physical therapy, and the like. Um, I like to confess I have been a cannabis consumer of high THC for the past uh, 12 plus years of my life. My family was very aware of that. And so it was a family uh, endeavor to explore CBD. I'm sure everybody here can relate, maybe the people listening, while CBD is very popular now, it's not super regulated and it only became federally legal just two years ago. So this industry is very new, very emerging. And uh, prior to that, I did corporate brand marketing, tech, digital, and uh, really love branding and marketing. That's kind of my sweet spot. So happy to be here and, and dive into this panel. Great, thank you so much. Um, Corey, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. So you guys already know that I'm the co-founder of Superhue, which is a CBD tonic. But um, in addition to Superhue, my uh, business partner and I have partnered up with a few other individuals to apply for some cannabis cultivation and production licenses in the Midwest, specifically in Illinois and in Michigan. So I can speak to both um, starting your own CBD business, and then I can also speak to what the process has been so far for me in applying for um, these highly regulated cannabis licenses. Um, prior to getting into like CBD and cannabis, I was an attorney. Well, I still am an attorney, but I was a practicing attorney for four years. Uh, I worked at a couple law firms and eventually moved into an in-house role with my family's restaurant businesses. So doing a lot of corporate and regulatory work already. Um, but because I have a lot of this like family entrepreneurial thing going on, I've always had a desire to start something of my own. And what attracted me to cannabis and CBD is just like the newness of it all. Um, I felt that there was a lot of innovation opportunities and a lot of opportunities, especially for women in this industry that is so new. Um, and then probably like the last thing is just like the benefits that the plants themselves I've experienced from them, both CBD and cannabis, like both my wellness routine, my social routine. I just wanted to be a part of bringing that, normalizing it and bringing it to other people as well. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Um, Celia, do you want to go next? Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Silly Bailey. Um, as Whitney mentioned, I'm the Director of Development and Operations at Canopy Boulder. I did not found Canopy, so I may be the only non-founder here, but um, Canopy is a venture capital fund and business accelerator, so I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, we invest in early and growth stage, primarily cannabis technology companies, um, but other ancillary businesses, as well as some hemp and CBD brands as well. Um, my journey into cannabis was a bit of an accident. I've been a user of cannabis uh, for most of my adult life and um, came out to Colorado to do my uh, MBA um, up in Fort Collins at the Colorado State University um, and kind of accidentally got into cannabis, just happened to get a job. My um, MBA was really focused around entrepreneurial theory, um, startup ecosystems and impact business. So how we can use um, capitalism to change the world and cannabis really was um, interesting to me in the fact that it was brand new. It was, it is still very much a startup industry um, with only startups operating in it because of its um, novelty. And also I think that cannabis does have uh, a lot of potential to change the world in a positive way. Um, whether or not we're doing that the best way we can be doing it right now, I think is a, is a different topic, um, which 
would be awesome to jump into at some point. But um, yeah, that's a little bit about my background. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, John, last but not least. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, really grateful to be on this panel with these amazing women and for, with GA. You guys do amazing things all around the world. Um, so again, yeah, my name is John Shute. I'm CEO of Puff Creative. Uh, we are a full service marketing agency uh, based out of Colorado, but we have our team and clients are all over the country and even the globe right now. Um, we've been around for about <laughs> we've been around for about uh, four, four years or so, and uh, we're doing everything from branding to packaging, website design, SEO, social media, blogging, email marketing, consulting. We're doing like animation and really fun, fun projects right now. And um, we've always been very um, equity, uh, sustainability, community focused uh, since the beginning. And we try to work with folks who are like-minded like ourselves because that's the way we want to kind of see the future of the industry and um you know prior to uh, puff creative i actually right after i got my um mba in project management i was doing nightlife marketing um which is completely different you would think from cannabis but from a creative and like innovative perspective they're actually pretty similar um but i did that for about a year and didn't really feel that as that fulfilled um, and I, you know, realized how beneficial cannabis was to, um, you know, myself and also people who are suffering with drugs and uh, people who are going through PTSD and people who are just had general pain or headaches or migraines. Um, so I figure, you know, what better way to, you know, educate folks on cannabis than to get involved in marketing. And uh, my first initial job was uh, actually marketing for a contract manufacturing company out of California, which was I was working remotely. Uh, so I learned so much about the industry from formulations, the packaging, to distribution, to what goes into those relationships and like what goes into the dispensary and the bud tenders and the sales and, uh, and how deep the rabbit hole actually goes, which we'll probably talk a bit about today. Um, and then I ended up getting screwed over, uh, which is pretty standard for people who are just getting into the cannabis industry. I'm sure everyone on this panel probably has experienced that. Um, so after that, I realized, you know, just, you know, what value I brought to the industry and I wanted to continue that dream I had. Um, and that's kind of how Puff Creative started. You know, I figured why not offer these services to people who are like-minded like myself. Uh, I have two business partners who I'm very grateful for. And uh, again, just super stoked to be on this panel and, and share some great knowledge with everyone. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, so I think that everyone will probably want to know right off the bat um, how you all have been affected by the pandemic with your businesses. Um, Shada, would you like to start with that one? Yeah, I think uh, having a retail location kind of put us in a really sticky position because especially being in Texas where um, we were witnessing other states like California and Colorado mark cannabis as an essential business to stay open. Texas, especially in Austin, explicitly said CBD stores need to close down. So of course you're kind of stuck between this safety, health concern, don't want to be operating because we don't know what's happening, but then also recognizing where cannabis was sitting kind of at a national level. Um, I think it was getting a lot of attention despite what was happening. And so for us, luckily being a family brand, we were able to, I think, pivot in a time where other brands, at least operating a physical brick and mortar, were struggling a little bit in our locale. Um, examples like my background being digital tech, I mean, that in and of itself is a struggle aside from COVID, being online, selling, payment processing, merchants, um, being online is a challenge. Being online with a retail is another challenge because you need a system to speak, to manage that inventory. So that was already an issue that we've been navigating um, very funly over the past two years that when COVID hit, thankfully I already had a website. I was not one of those businesses who had to kind of scramble to get online, but I definitely saw a lot of businesses, again, locally and just nationally in this, uh, the scheme of things where online is a very clear um, pain point for this industry. Now, the flip side, I think of COVID, it, it has pushed our industry 
into technology, I think a little bit faster. So I'm kind of interested to see what Celia is going to say, because I think um, when you're looking at these delivery services, again, I'm being in Texas, but I do have a pretty good understanding nationally what's going on. You saw services like delivery services in states like California, they're already established services, but in Colorado, that's something that they're still fighting to have. Austin, we don't even have cannabis delivery. It's kind of coming up. And so you just see where different states have different ways that they've been able to overcome, I think, what COVID caused. So being able to get delivery services, again, being from Texas, we um, relied really heavily on our online opportunity, as well as we're able to shift into operating um, a pretty lean team because it was my sisters and we were all pretty much in COVID quarantining together. But we essentially shut our store down retail wise so people couldn't walk in. We opened up curbside pickup as well as started making deliveries ourselves. I mean, like my sisters and I taking our customers products across town. So I think um, scrappiness is definitely a skill that you need to be comfortable with because even if you sit in a you know, chair of founder or CEO, you kind of have to roll your sleeves up and get, um, get dirty, get into the industry. But yeah, I would say... Um, the hard part and the blessing in disguise is the technology piece. And I think um, while COVID is still very much here still, obviously cities and states are reopening. And so while we're seeing foot traffic pick back up, my online business is even more popular, which I think in the spectrum of this industry too, at least from a CBD perspective, it's a different consumer. And as somebody who consumes a lot of cannabis, I can acknowledge it's a different consumer. Um, those consumers, especially when we launched in the industry two years ago, we were one of the first brands to operate in Austin and Texas really. And coming from online, that was my preference was to be online aside from all these hurdles that I already established. Um, but consumers, they didn't know what they were buying. They were curious. We struggled as an industry with education. Now, I think we've had some time to get our feet uh, wet a little bit in terms of how we educate, create content, um, you know, proper labeling, marketing. But then with COVID, it's, it's kind of forced people into a position of, well, why don't I stay home? Why don't I just order delivery? Why don't I just, you know, shop online with these cannabis brands? And so I think it's been a really cool uh, turning point for us to be able to, to lean into that tech piece a little bit. That's awesome that you're making the most of it. Great That's to hear. interesting that your CBD store was told to shut down, even though dispensaries were considered essential in all the other states. Yeah, Texas explicitly, we were looking in the rules and it had said, you know, restaurants are essential, CBD shops, not essential. And we were like, ooh, what a dig in a state where so much tension is already happening because of cannabis. It felt extra personal as we're still currently fighting for smokable laws and higher THC percentages. Wow. John, since I have you off mute, <laughs> would you like oh, to yeah. add to would you like <laughs> to add to how um Pup Creative has been impacted by the pandemic? Yeah, for sure. Um I think I think our situation is pretty interesting because like we deal with so many different types of clients who have been impacted in so many different ways. Um so like initially for me as like the leader of my organization, it was like oh man, like, you know, who's going to be cutting back? You know, like I'm pretty, like I, at one point, of course, I was like, man, we're going to lose every client right now. Uh, this is going to be really interesting. Um, but that didn't happen. Of course, you know, we took the liberty to just have conversations with each and every single one of our clients to learn exactly what was going on in their, in their worlds, how they were impacted. Um, everyone was impacted in different ways, both negative and positive. Like for example, um, certain people like, you know, vape companies or folks who are sourcing certain products, their supply chains were impacted by COVID. Um, so then they just didn't have products to actually get out to market, which was like interesting. Um, you know, also like places um, like Denver, um, you know, although, you know, sales have really gone up here and I believe Boulder too, um, you know, Denver also relies heavily on tourism and so do like the mountain towns here. Uh, so we have some clients who were just in, mountain town dispensaries who were super impacted in a negative way. So we had to do this huge push to get them into new dispensaries here in Denver. Um, on the positive note, you know, kind of Shada was saying like, you know, cannabis has been deemed essential. So there has been this um, rapid expansion from a B to B, B to C, and even like a political perspective over the past 10 months. Um, so, you know, I would say in the beginning, although we were kind of scrambling and really trying to figure out like what um, you know, this future is looking like, even though we still <laughs> don't necessarily know what that is. 
Um, you know, we took it, we, we kind of like got down to the bare bones. We took the liberty to focus more on mental health as a team. Uh, we actually got rid of a few clients um, who we just didn't think were a right fit for this like point in the world for us. Um, which, you know, even though we were starting to lose a little bit of money, we even lost more um, just because I saw the long-term benefit of just us prioritizing mental health, that life balance, like all of these key things that we know we all need to help produce for this like unstable world we're living in. So um, yeah, really interesting. But uh, again, there is like these hidden, you know, gems of situations and like things that have happened over this time that I'm grateful for, um, even though things are pretty nuts still. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for telling us about that. Um, so obviously our industry faces a lot more hurdles than other industries do. And I'm interested in hearing um, about the types of hurdles that you all have faced just being leaders in this industry. So um, Corey, would you like to start there? Definitely. <laughs> Um, yeah, there are a lot of hurdles. Um, as was mentioned previously, the 2018 Farm Bill legalized hemp nationally. But um, just like getting to understand like the state and local requirements is really big. And even more is relaying those, um, those rules to your customers. So your customers don't know what's legal, what's not. They're very, very easily confused. Um, it, even like our retailers um, are very easily confused on what they can carry, what they can't carry. Um, one of the other really big things for us, SuperHue, is that we are a consumer packaged goods. So we're a beverage. Um, the FDA has not put out any guidelines on whether you can put CBD in food and beverage. And if so, you know, how much? And um, that creates just a lot of uncertainty for people. Um, and especially for us, the way that we sell our drink primarily is through retail accounts because um, selling a six pack online is awesome. You should all buy it, but you know, shipping is expensive. Um, buying six pack beverages, you know, it's not the way that most people buy them. So big, you know, retailers, national retailers still are not touching anything with CBD in it. So they won't even bring it into their stores, which is just like an interesting thing to think about because if you think about the CBD industry, I I find that it has very low barriers to entry. Um, you can start a CBD product, I would say easier than a lot of other things at this point. Um, but like once you're up and running is when kind of the big, um, you realize how difficult it is to educate people and to get your product out there and to just really sustain something like that. Um, and just kind of related is just like common language and industry terms, again, just, a lot of consumer confusion um, and because it's so low of a barrier to entry and there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of competition out there and not all competitors are using good CBD or even CBD at all. I mean, some people are saying they're using hemp seed, hemp seed oil, which is not hemp extract. Um, so it's just kind of, finding your way through that whole mess and trying to really connect with your consumers. Um, and then kind of like technology focused. Uh, I'm interested, maybe John, like would probably be able to help me out on this, but like we can't Facebook, Instagram, um, YouTube now, I think they like flag anything CBD wise. So we aren't able to like a lot of other smaller businesses uh, send out promotions or sponsored, um, like sponsored posts because they're just not allowed on those platforms. So, so there, there yeah, are it's actually, it's been a complete nightmare that actually the past like couple of months in particular, like um, we were sneaking through like certain, certain types of like hemp brands and like can, cannabis, even consulting and hemp consulting company ads and stuff. And yeah, all of a sudden now they're all getting flagged, even though they went through and even most of them actually follow the guidelines, um, which is really interesting. Um, and what's even more interesting is that now even domain companies like GoDaddy, um, payment uh, companies like Square and Stripe, everyone seems to be tightening things up right now. Um, when you would think because cannabis is essential, people are going through 
very interesting forms of mental health, you know, situations right now. So you'd think that, you know, in the normal world, we should, you know, have easy access and advertising solutions. People get access to this plant and cannabinoids that can really help them. And they seem to be making it even harder than before in certain cases, which um, is pretty annoying, but also, you know, it, it's, I kind of geek out over figuring out how it works. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a constant battle every day since, since I've gotten in this industry. <laughs> yeah, probably a little bit of your help on that, on that end. <laughs> yeah. sure. Cool. And then just to, just to back up, just in case anyone that's watching doesn't know the difference between THC and CBD, um, Celia, do you want to explain that one? <laughs> sure. So um, THC and CBD are two of the cannabinoids that come from the cannabis plant. Um, hemp and cannabis, as you know it, marijuana are basically the same plant. Um, it's about a threshold of THC. So arbitrary threshold 0.3% THC um, and above makes it cannabis um, and is uh, regulated under Schedule 1 um, uh, narcotic. CBD is one of the popular cannabinoids um, that's found heavily in hemp. It's found in marijuana plants as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the difference. There's lots of other cannabinoids that um, are exciting. There's a lot of research being done around right now um, and that I think have the potential to be maybe just as exciting or more exciting than CBD. So um, I think there's a lot that remains to be seen. And I think just to touch on one other thing about CBD, um, I think just to be slightly devil's advocate here, it is very annoying that we still don't have rules and um, regulations around consumable CBD. It's very, very annoying and it's really difficult to business. Um, but at the same time, I think that when we talk about CBD as a health benefit, it's really important that we are doing the proper research and really understanding how these compounds interact with our bodies um, and interact with other potential medications. So um, I just like to throw that out there. I think there's a lot of people who have found their own anecdotal um, evidence that these products work for them. And I think that's amazing. And, and um, I personally am a user of THC and CBD for medical reasons, but I think that um, it's important just to remember that, that a lot of the reason why it's been slow is because we really just don't have much information. And there's a lot of um, restrictions around being able to get that research done um, in part due to the way that we consider the plant um, in this country. Absolutely. Sorry to Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, cool. So let's let's hop back to some of the hurdles that you guys might be facing right now. Um, Shada, do you have anything to add to what you shared before with your your retail space being shut down? outside of the pandemic. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> oh, I'm muted. Sorry. I was gonna say one thing that comes to mind, that's probably a little bit of like education for those listening, just kind of in the vein of CBD being unregulated. Um, most of us who are cannabis consumers, both anecdotally, and I believe there's research that proves smoking, it is the most fastest way to experience. It's got the most bioavailable. So there's this culture side of like, what is cannabis culture, smoke culture, um, which is, I think, part of the problem. It's, it's the stigma of this plant. It's, you know, smoking dope behind the bleachers with your friends. Um, but in Texas, they are trying to currently, we, we just barely skimped past, um, we're dealing with a smokable ban. So basically in the middle of COVID in an effort to regulate, which I'm totally pro-regulation because right now you can buy CBD in a gas station and you can buy CBD from me. And I bet one of us is more educated than the other. So, you know, consumers don't know that though. I think Corey mentioned that, you know, these consumers, they, they're being marketed, um, poorly marketed by a lot of people. And so I think you deal with kind of just the industry in general. Then for those of us who are retailers in the state, um, you're thinking of the farmer. So people who want to grow, who want to convert their farms to actually be smokable products, um, processors, manufacturers, people who want to, you know, process and extract, and then the retailers. And so Texas right now uh, decided that they were going to put a ban on the retail sale of smokable hemp in the state of Texas, effective August 2nd. We had until I think like August 5th to 
to actually pull the products off of our shelves and to deal with it. And then there were a couple companies who sued the state. And so the judge presiding over the case actually put a restraining order on the ban so then we could put products back on the shelf. Then we were jerked around for a couple of weeks, took the products back off the shelf, then put them back on the shelf. And now I can happily say they are on the shelf until February 1st, 2021, when the case gets reopened and we get to see what Texas decides next. And so I think you have the regulatory side, which is obviously trying to manage um, who has access to these products and where they can get them. But from a marketing perspective, it pains me. And this is like a, a application story. We talked to our lawyer, we have a cannabis lawyer. She's one of the best in the state. And she said, you know, if, if I can take it to court and defend that it's not for smokable, then it's okay to sell. So loose bud, you can make teas, you can make extractions. So that was something that we were kind of coached on. It's okay, you can sell loose bud just for non-smokable. Great, now I have to go relabel all my packaging. Now I have to go remarket all my stuff. I gotta go on social media and tell my customers, wink, wink, you're gonna come in and it's gonna say not for smokable, but you know, you can put this stuff that looks like cannabis in a little pipe and smoke it. And, and that's like one example of so many have to relabel joints as hemp sticks. I kid you not, I sent a hemp stick to a customer and this is after we're already educating, making videos, creating content, trying to tee it up that this is coming. I had a customer Say, I thought I ordered a joint. What is a hemp stick and what do I do with it? I was like, lady, it has a filter on it. You smoke it just like you would a joint. I just can't say that to you. So to kind of back up, the hard part is you got to pay attention to what's happening both at a national level, but also at a city and state level. And so unfortunately for us, retailers, uh, licensing, those are all really great uh, milestones, but actually just selling products that other states or cities might have more free access to has been proven to be quite interesting. But like I said, we can sell all those products. I can sell them in retail and I can ship them um, until February 1st, 2021. So on February 21st, 2021, let's talk and see what happens. But yeah, Texas likes to keep it interesting. <laughs> And just to just to add to that too, like the cannabis industry in general, even pre-COVID, um, you know, packaging regulate and same thing with hemp, you know, packaging regulations on a national level, state to state, um, change all the time. So, you know, when California was going through its crazy recreational use uh legislative pro legislative process, you know, companies were spending, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars on their bulk packaging, you know, for the year. And then two months later, the government's like, oh, you know, we're going to actually put this other little mark on the packaging we didn't tell you about. So then all of that packaging now is, you know, useless. Um, and, and even more so now during COVID, you know, in the beginning, the rules were changing, you know, similar to, to what um, Shada was mentioning, like the rules are changing for dispensaries, I believe, like almost every single day. Uh, there was a glass window up the next day there wasn't a glass window up they had to wear gloves one day the next day they didn't um, so you know and again the essential thing to add on top of that so we're going to see this rapid you know change and acceleration of the industry uh, and at the same time um, there's going to be all these crazy rules and regulations we're going to be experiencing because COVID's still around we, we don't know what's going to happen with the next election and what's going to uh, you know, what's going to happen to cannabis and hemp after that. Um, so it's really, really interesting um, to be a part of this industry in general, but especially right now in particular. So um, that that's crazy that that's what you're doing with Shada. Oh my God. Well, you bring up a really fair point. And I think a lot of brands, especially consulting and just like navigating the industry with my peers, you start to observe, you know, how are people getting around it? And so we just decided to bring all of our label production in house. So I just invested in a printer mm. so that I have that flexibility off the cuff to be able to go in and make a change or to make smaller batches of labels. And then the flip side of that is like, again, as a marketer who has the integrity of wanting consumers to know exactly what products they're getting, it's a hard spot where it's like, okay, I'm going to follow the law. And the law says, I can't market this as a smokable, but but you and I both know smoking is one of the most fast ways to experience the benefits, the medicinal benefits of cannabis. Now, how do I go educate a consumer who's already skeptical? They're already cautious. They and already don't have post a trepidation. Of them smoking, because you'll get you'll get your right, Facebook that, deleted. <laughs> exactly. And then you put it on social media, and so it's this kind of like you said it. It's a dance you kind of got to do. And I feel yep. very comfortable doing the dance. But I think most people getting into the industry, Karina mentioned it too. It's like you know anybody can get in, but then once you're in, it's like oh shit you know what did I sign up for I'm getting yeah. soccer punched every day <laughs> I think that you know the cannabis industry in general 
like hurdles, like what hurdles do, do we deal with? The, everything is hurdles. It's all hurdles. Um, it's not easy. It changes all the time. Like I've been in the industry since 2016. That feels like a lifetime. And it's only four years. Um, and where we were four years ago versus where we are now is like night and day. Um, and I think that the biggest hurdle that cannabis companies come up against is that balance between scale and regulation. It's so hard to scale when you have things happening, like all of a sudden packaging has to be different or um, the rules around labor is different all of a sudden. Um, you know, on the topic of hurdles, there's a tax code issue that THC touching companies deal with, 280E. Um, if you're interested in cannabis and you don't know about that, Google it. Um, but it is incredibly painful for cannabis companies and it means labor is more expensive. It means marketing is more expensive. It means all of that stuff um, costs more money. And so I think for cannabis companies often, um, and unfortunately sort of speaking to what's going on in the industry, the incentives are set up to cut labor costs, right? The incentives are set up to turn to technology um, and not necessarily reinvest in the community. And that's, um, I think, a bummer. That's a huge bummer. And yeah, just to add to that too, it's like when I remember when I first started Pup Creative, like I would, you know, fly home to New Jersey where I'm from and my parents and my family would be like, oh, you, you know, you must be crushing it. The industry is just booming. Everyone is just peace and love and green and environmentally friendly. And at that time, I like, we just got started and I was getting bounced between these two public companies. They were just like abusing us. Um, and I was like, that's actually the opposite of what, it's like extremely cutthroat from my experience right now. It's not environmentally friendly. Um, it's not community focused and, you know, and that's, yeah, that's like the driving force. I feel like behind like a lot of like what we're all trying to work towards, which is, which is awesome. That's not always the case. Absolutely. Um, let's see. So, um, Karina, I'm interested in um, what you have to say about how Chicago has, how it's kind of changed since the legalization of recreational cannabis. Yeah. Um, well, January 1 was very exciting this year in Illinois because um, recreational cannabis became legal. So it had been legal in Illinois medically. Um, but, you know, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard. You know, it's easy and hard to get a medical card. You know, people are very intimidated to go get a medical card. Um, so it was just, like, really exciting to see it become recreational. And the way that that worked was that everyone in Illinois who had a medical license automatically on January 1 got a recreational, like they turned rec, rec as well, and, and then also got a second license in order to open another facility or store, whatever it is that they specialized in, whether it be cultivation or um, retail. So, um, so since January 1, there've been like quite a few dispensaries around Chicago that have popped up in the uh, suburbs that have popped up. There's one right off the highway headed to my parents' house and my sister and I are like, yes, like we are super happy about it. And, and you know, people are really excited about it and they wanna try it, but um, because there were only so many licenses that were given, um, the supply is really low in Illinois right now. So, so there's not enough supply for, for the amount of people that are trying to buy um, naturally much of it has to be reserved for medical as it should um, to make sure that they have enough supply for them. And so there was lines, I mean, I can't, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but the numbers were crazy in Illinois this year so far, um, how much money the cannabis industry has made in Illinois and how much tax revenue it has generated for Illinois. The lines were just down the block. I mean, crazy for the first people lined up, I think, on New Year's Eve, um, waiting for it to happen. So it's really exciting. But then you have like the other half of people that are still very um, uneducated and scared to try it. So um, I think it just has, it's a lot of responsibility and pressure on cannabis companies to educate and make people feel like they can walk into their stores and feel comfortable and not feel out of place. But every day is kind of like slowly working towards that. But it's been really exciting. Sweet. That is very exciting. I'm excited for everyone in Chicago. 
Um, John, thinking about that from pretty much the opposite perspective here in Denver, we were just talking about how you can get a $30 eighth or ounce right now of flour. Yeah, um, which is so crazy. Yeah, what's your perspective on how how the recreational market has developed here in Denver? Um, well, I mean, over the years, it's definitely, you know, I, I haven't been in Denver for longer. I think it's my fourth year here. Um, and even in just these four years, it's changed a bunch. Um, it's definitely becoming a bit more, uh, like from a brand and, you know, company-wise, it's definitely becoming a bit more corporate. There's definitely some bigger organizations coming in. Uh, that are, you know, own multiple brands and you're seeing those multiple brands, even in some cases competing against each other in dispensaries. Um, more so, I think, you know, when recreation and medical uh, first started here in Colorado, there definitely was more like mom and pop shops and even some of the, you know, bigger brands like I think, you know, Wana and you know some of these bigger conglomerates were even, you know, considered mom and shop pop shops like back then. So um, from a, you know, uh, you know, consumer and business perspective, um, recently, I, I would say that um, recreational marijuana use has drastically increased here, um, even though it was already high. Um, I know, you know, since COVID, my, my use has drastically increased uh, compared to what it used to be. Um, but, you know, just piggybacking off what uh, Celia said, you know, it, you know the, the plant does, um, you know, impact everyone differently. So, I think people have been taking this time to kind of, even in a, a mature or like mature market like Colorado or an immature market like Illinois, um, I think consumers are taking the time to see, you know, what formula actually works right for them. Um, because, um, you know, you know, abu use, abusing alcohol or other drugs to help with your mental health or stressor is not really, in my opinion, as sustainable as cannabis. So, um, that being said, I'm really grateful to be in a state that I'm able to just go down the street and buy a $30 um, ounce uh, of shake, but um, still really, really, really great stuff. Um, and yeah, you know, pr pricing here, I think is completely different from Chicago and Illinois, you know, prices are drastically decre decreasing. Um, but I think due to a lot of these, the fires and the weird weather that is going on here a lot of the outdoor and hemp and cannabis growers have been impacted in a negative way um so that's going to actually make the market a bit more interesting here and a bit more competitive and might potentially raise the price um i know uh one of my clients who does uh wholesale flour and they do they give they also sell trim to uh, mips here in colorado um they actually right after harvest will just hold on to all of their product until the summertime uh, when the prices go back up because everyone will be out by then. Um, so be, due to the fires and the recent weather, it's intriguing to see actually how the market's gonna be about a year from now um, because a lot of people are pretty strategic about how they utilize their, their wholesale flour. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. And then we'll pop over to Shada. You're coming fr from another completely opposite perspective. What's it like to navigate being in a place where um, there is no recreational cannabis? Let me just start by saying I was born and raised in Austin, Texas, and I never thought in my young adult life we would see this excitement for cannabis. And I'll also caveat my statement with I love marijuana and I consume a lot of it in legal states when I am visiting. With that said, I think uh, Texans, they're just, they're curious and they're also cautious. And so I never thought that we would be in a position to be educating from CBD, but actually the more personal use of CBD that I go through, as well as running our business and anecdotally hearing how it's impacting our customers, I think CBD really swung the door open. I mean, we're talking about these other cannabinoids. There's over 160 plus of them, you know, depending on who you talk to, at least over a hundred of them. They all have different properties, some more pronounced than others. We started selling products like Delta 8 THC and CBN and CBG. And even when I launched Restart two years ago, I was kind of joking with some of y'all before. I, I, I feel like I come from Colorado. I spent about half my year there. So as a consumer, I do a lot of due diligence and I have friends working in the legal industry and I would ask them, 
where's your CBD strains? You know, like, let's talk about these other cannabinoids. It just wasn't something that you were seeing from a consumer perspective. And so for better or worse, I think some people coming from THC might be like, oh, CBD, that's cute. Like my customers ask us a lot, you know, are you getting ready to open a THC full on dispensary or are you going to get rid of CBD when, you know, THC becomes legal? I kind of have to stay, take a step back because I think CBD is really helping drive this industry forward. I think the CBD is helping drive this conversation into households where people weren't having these conversations before. I mean, to also fall on a sword. I mean, I'm a millennial. I built my brand with my peers in mind. Um, and the, the people who walk through my door are not me's. The people who walk through my door are parents. Um, they're, you know, on medication that they would either like to titrate off of or get off of completely. And it's just one of those things where there's this wide spectrum of who is a cannabis consumer, but I think CBD has really opened the door for more education, more access, more resources, um, more research to be done on this plant. So that way we can fully understand how this interacts with our varying bodies, our varying biochemistries. Um, but so it's really exciting, I think, to be in Texas as somebody who, again, loves very much high THC. I think the CBD market has been very surprising because, I mean, Texas is interesting. I wouldn't say every market, every city is as buzzy as Austin, but for better or worse, Austin's a pretty popular, um, as such, if you visited Austin, you know, we're a live music capital of the world. People like their cannabis and, and entertainment, um, but it's been very well received. And so we've found a lot of success just being a community brand. I mean, we're very involved in the hospitality space. I mean, Karina, you're talking about the FDA and CBD and food and beverage. I'm a former food blogger. So all of my restaurant chef friends decided, you know, let's collaborate. So last year for National CBD Day, we launched CBD pinted ice cream with one of the top uh, ice cream brands coming out of Austin. And, and that was such a fun way for us to bring this product into um, a new market, as well as obviously promote our brand and ultimately build partnership with our community and just helping people ease into this conversation of what is CBD and cannabis. Um, but yeah, it's obviously the wild, wild west because it's like, is this even legal? Should I be putting this in this product? How do I educate to the consumer? I mean, we obviously had parents too who were like, why are, why are you giving CBD ice cream? Can children have that? The caveat is we use CBD isolate. There was no THC. We did heavily marketing. We made sure everybody who was dispensing it was trained. They all linked back to a QR code that drive to our website with a whole landing page. So it's not just like you're kind of throwing things against a wall and hoping it sticks. There's obviously a lot of strategy and thought behind it. But the flip side is you come sometimes looking like, well, who's doing it? better. Like Delta eight's a huge scare right now, I think nationally, but in Texas, because we don't have Delta nine, Delta eight is very buzzy and very popular to us. And uh, there's just a lot of quality concerns. And so people are asking a lot of questions and don't know what they're consuming slash are consuming and are getting legally messed up. It's just a very um, interesting plant that we have not fully researched. And yet the consumer market is driving this demand forward that as a brand, Delta eight came on my radar because a customer came in and I'm in the industry and I talk to peers every day of my life and I'm on LinkedIn and I'm listening to panels and I'm doing reports and I'm, I'm in the industry. And yet still it's happening so fast that consumers are coming and saying, Oh, well, what's this new cannabinoid and how can I get it? And what is it going to do to me? And you're like, well, oh shit, I don't know what Delta eight is, but I will find out and try to, you know, help bring it to market in a safe way. So yeah little bit of Texas for you. I thought that was such a weird, like when I found out about it too, I was like, what? <laughs> but it seems well, so Delta, to be... Delta 8's illegal in Colorado, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Oh, really? So yeah. So it's very weird um, because technically it's, I, I just learned this, a Delta 8 edible, if it metabolizes just like Delta 9. So there's definitely like a attrition rate. So right now, some of my friends who are manufacturing, they're saying like a 15 milligram Delta 8 edible is equivalent to 10 milligrams of THC. And then legally we're able to sell it. So people yeah, are buying it. Yeah. 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 No, it's super strange. And one, one thing I wanted to piggyback off of um, kind of points you're making in the middle, middle there. Um, I, I totally agree that, you know, the, the future of cannabis, I feel like is this entourage effect of, you know, cannabinoids working together with terpene profiles so people get this specific medicinal effect from it. And again, you know, it hits everyone differently, um, but that's actually using the plant to its full medicinal capabilities. Um, and that brings a point again to the education of each market actually, which is, which is pretty interesting where I would say a market like Colorado, 
um, is one of the most educated consumer markets in the country, I, I would say maybe, um, yeah. And um, a consumer here would probably be more intrigued by an edible that has um, CBG, CBN and THCV mixed with two different terpene profiles because they understand the medicinal benefits of that. Whereas if we were, if I was consulting a brand who was entering a brand new market like Illinois, and they were debating whether to invest in CBG to put in their edibles because they wanted to make it more quality, um, maybe in the short term, that wouldn't be a decision you'd make because you might actually waste money because the consumer has no idea what CBG is in the Illinois market. Um, not saying that it wouldn't be a good idea because you know people should be consuming CBG, um, but certain brands you know are considering these things because each market is just so unique. Um, so I felt that felt that was a good point to make with the difference between the recreational markets is really an education level from a consumer, a bud tender, and a B two B perspective too. So. so just to jump in, I think that that topic, John, that you're talking about right now is um, one of my most exciting topics. I love the concept yeah. of how can cannabis companies are understanding how the market is beginning to accept new products because to your point, John, like in Colorado, there's a lot of understanding about these products, but that may not be the case in even Massachusetts or even parts of California, maybe. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I listened to Nancy Whiteman, who's the CEO of Wanna Talk, and she said that their top concern right now and their top interest is in figuring out at what point consumers are ready for innovative technology being like cutting edge but not being too cutting edge right and so i think for a lot of those companies they turn to technologies and they turn to um which is what makes me excited i get excited about what's out there to kind of understand what consumers are ready for um, and be responsive to that so i think that that's a, a key piece and and bud tender education and how we use bud tenders um, I think is another really interesting area. There's a lot of cool companies that are sort of tackling that space um, and trying to educate the consumer from the point of sale, um, which is the bud tender. Yeah, I'm going to put a uh, link to an analytical um, company that we reference, uh, BDS Analytics. Um, they have some really, really great data. That's a good reference point for folks to see like what's happening trend wise and state and in our country. They're a cannabis company. Exactly. <laughs> Love that. Such a small little world. I know. <laughs> um, so I guess speaking towards kind of like the future of cannabis, um, I'm interested, Corey, starting with you, uh, to hear about what you see as the, the top um, trends and opportunities that are emerging right now. Yeah, I think pretty much everyone on this panel kind of hit it on the head where cannabis is just so diverse, right? It, it's something different for every person. So I'll kind of speak to this in like the CBD realm, what I see happening and then in the cannabis realm. So in CBD, um, the diversity of reasons to use CBD is crazy. I mean, people use it for anxiety. They use it for pain. They use it, um, yeah, to get off other medication. Um, for sleep. I mean, so I think what people have started to do and, and I think is going to keep happening is um, have like targeted products mixing with not only other cannabinoids, but also like adaptogens or uh, melatonin and, you know, say this is great for sleep and companies are already doing that because technically you can't say that CBD is great for sleep on your label. So put melatonin on there and you kind of can get around that. Um, you, you know, I've seen a lot of things with like caffeine. So I think they're going to really like hone in on, you know, what is it that you personally want to get from CBD because it is so different for everybody. And you're going to see a lot of that coming up, I think. Um, and then in terms of cannabis, when states like Colorado, Washington, Oregon, when they first legalized, I think flour was the most predominant product that was being sold. And, but in, you know, the, I don't know if it's like five or six years since Colorado has now legalized, um, you're seeing flour is still very popular, but the share that that's um, taking up is going down and people are, um, you know, moving toward edibles. And I, and I think that's going to keep happening. And the reason 
that that makes a lot of sense is that there's a lot of these what, what I and a lot of other people like to call can of curious consumers. So it's people that are very curious about cannabis that want to try it, but you know, they don't want to go smoke, especially if they have never smoked before. So putting out products that are very familiar to people like gummies or chocolates, um, that's going to get people to try them. And then kind of related to that, I see a lot of microdosing going on um, in the industry. So instead of taking a 10 or 20 milligram chocolate, you know, people are taking two milligrams, two milligram gummies, um, two milligram drinks to just kind of like go about their day and really like understand what the plant does for them and kind of where they want to be. And I think that that's going to lead to also like normalization of cannabis and like also socialization of cannabis. I think it's going to move from getting high on your couch to going out and having friends and like hanging out with friends and, you know, having a couple of drinks that have like five milligrams of THC and just being fun. So that's kind of like what I see there. Definitely. Um, John, do you have anything to add to that that we haven't really discussed yet? Um, I mean, I, I kind of feel the same way. Um, you know, like for me personally, like I, I think I use cannabis and cannabinoids in so many different ways. Um, you know, I am, I'm a huge fan of microdosing because the worst feeling in the world, I think, is taking like too much of an edible and like having a panic attack and freaking out, you know, it's like the worst. Um, so yeah, I, I think I just, I totally agree with like what she's saying in, in regards to um, the industry is really heading in a, in a place where we're trying to end the stigma um, and focus on how cannabis can bring out the best in you. Um, because it really does bring out the best in me, enhances, you know, everything I do from snowboarding to surfing to playing music um, to <laughs> being able to understand, like, when my wife's mad at me to, <laughs> you know, just going out and being a good person in the world. Um, you know, a few other areas that I really would love to see cannabis and hemp, you know, shift towards are things that, you know, I touched on earlier. Um, you know, we're going through a really interesting time of um, you know, our country is experiencing in regards to racism and social injustice and the war on drugs. Um, so I really feel like it's, it's an obligation of folks within the cannabis and hemp industries to really focus gears on fighting against social injustice, um, finding ways to make this industry equitable. Um, one of our clients, the NACB, the National Association of Cannabis Businesses, actually just released uh, social equity policy guidelines that they're pitching to politicians all over the country, which is really, really cool. Um, again, sustainability, environmental, um, I really would love to see the industry shifting in towards that way. And again, to transparency, um, people really need to know and trust what they're consuming. Um, you know, I think that so many people forget that the real reason that we're in this thing is because of this plant. Um, so regardless of your branding and your cool, you know, products and this animation you might've made on your Instagram or whatever it may be, um, it all really comes down to the product itself. Um, so I would love to see, you know, better best practices in regards to standards all around for growing, contract manufacturing, lab tests, um, and figuring out ways that we can best like educate the like consumer and businesses um, on those best practices and just make people understand like why that's so important to the future. Um, and if we do that, I think we have a bright future of cannabis, but it's definitely going to be a really tough road to make all that come to life. So um, yeah, good. My two cents there. <laughs> we can dream big here. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of all about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Shada, do you have anything to add about um, what you see coming up for the cannabis industry or where you see it going in the next five to 10 years? Such a big question. I mean, I think a lot of the trends are already addressed in terms of you're having, you know, I think being a female who consumes a lot of cannabis. I feel like I've said that 10 times this whole panel. It's very clear. I love cannabis. Um, it's not normal, right? I think the traditional um, consumer, at least from a marketing perspective, is like a male of a certain age. And so I think as you see more age demographics, you see more gender 
um, you know, ranges. It's just really a plant that I think is so misunderstood. And for me, the sweet spot is really on the education, both as a brand operating in the space, as a consumer of the plant myself. I, I will admit, you know, prior to the CBD exposure um, incident of my accident, I was a heavy THC consumer and I didn't know what an endocannabinoid system was. And I wasn't really sure what CBD was either. And so I think again, um, to a point I made earlier, CBD in my opinion has really opened the door for us to do more discovery of these products and how these products interact with our own bodies. Um, I was in a conversation with a friend today. He drew a very unprofessional graph of basically like admitting and kind of recognizing most of us are overdosing you know there's like a level of productivity um that cannabis can enhance to john's point and then there's a drop off of overconsumption and it just kind of got me thinking you know dosing and then of course doing a lot of um both consumption as well as just like marketing and awareness in the industry of like sativa indica hybrid i think those are all kind of agreed upon as outdated terms and so when those are the only real thing that the industry kind of clings to is this kind of, is it a sativa? Is it an indica? Is it for daytime? Is it into couch? It just doesn't provide a lot of range for the true application of cannabis. And I like to also hopefully, you know, check me in 20, 30 years would like to see how my consumption of cannabis has hopefully helped me medicinally from an anecdotal perspective. And so I just think closing the gap, um, by being an advocate at a city and state level, you know, helping educate not only your consumers, but really your community. That's the policymakers, the law enforcement. Um, I know somebody kind of asked a question about, um, you know, the social justice component of it. And I think for us in Texas, weed and hemp look the same. That's why we're dealing with a smokable ban because these law enforcement officers don't know the difference. And so that obviously hurts the hemp industry because we want to be selling these products, but then it's also putting people in jail for a plant that you and I both know is not harmless and obviously is legal in other states. And so I think as a business, um, as, as a consumer, as just a person who loves the plant, it's important to normalize it. It's important to advocate for it. It's important to like reach into those areas. And so obviously the technology and application and microdosing is really important, but I think just like getting back to the foundations and being as educated as possible and putting that, um, not ownership, but that excitement, it's almost like inviting people into that. And so as a brand, I don't just sell CBD products. I sell this educational experience. And so, you know, we have customers who come into our retail, which I do think having a retail puts me in an interesting position to have real-time feedback from consumers. I'm a marketer. So I ask them every time they come into my store, you know, um, and just getting people, people's feedback. And so we had a lot of customers when the smokable ban was kind of in the height of it, who were like, well, this sucks. And we hate it. And, you know, Texas doesn't know. And it's like, Hey, did you know that you can leave a public comment? You are human who can vote. Did you know that you can help advocate and rally and, and join me on lobbying days and like get in touch with your policymakers? Like this isn't restricted for those of us who sit in positions of, um, you know, leadership in the cannabis industry. I really think it's an exciting time because I know some of us here are like influencers. I love it because you like we are the influencers, not we, but we the people. The mom who comes into my store who has a powerful experience with CBD for her kid who has epilepsy, that's a powerful testimony. That's somebody that I want to empower to be an influencer and then to go tell their story, whether that's to a policymaker, to law enforcement, or just to their best friend down the street who has a kid who's struggling with something similar. And so I think that's where I'm really excited is just us getting all on the same page in terms of what we're communicating, how we're communicating it, and then ultimately empowering the people because it's it's a plant at the end of the day. So it shouldn't be as... Um, as uh, stigmatized as we're uh, experiencing it right now. So I totally agree with everything you just said. I wanna jump in because I know that John and Shada both touched on kind of like the social equity and I saw that there was a question in the chat about it. And I mean, it, it frustrates a lot of people, I think, including myself that so many communities were really disproportionately impacted and put in prison for something that now in Illinois and in Colorado, I mean, people are just using recreationally as if it were alcohol or, or even, you know, whatnot. So um, it, it's a, it really is a really important issue. And Illinois got a lot of 
um, press and a lot of recognition for the program that they put together, um, which was a big social equity program that gave you for this round of licenses that there's actually, I mean, we could talk about this for a whole different panel, but um, that you had to have, um, you know, a social equity component to your application. And so I think it was really great that they tried to do that. It didn't necessarily pan out the way that they wanted it to. I don't, I don't think that it, it accomplished what they were trying to do, but I think we need to see more states try to do that. And, and in order to get our voices heard on what needs to happen, I completely agree with Shada. I think you need to find groups there. In Illinois, I know at least there are tens of, you know, 20s, what groups of people that are dedicated to just this issue. And you need to find yourself a part of those and be involved in the legislative process and lobbying for what it is that you want. Because, um, I mean, first and foremost, decriminalization is a no-brainer to me. Um, that needs to happen ASAP. And then past that is how do you get more people of color, more people that have been affected by the drug in the past involved in an industry that is growing, like, because they need to be a part of it as well. That's awesome. I feel like we could just like spend another hour just on that topic. I, I just um, realized we haven't even talked about like technology yet. And that's like the best. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to talk about te technology, John? <laughs> I feel like we should, I mean, I do, but I feel like I want to hear just a little bit more like from Celia about it because she's so like yeah. immersed in it. And like, I kind of like was so stoked to see her on this. Um, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would love to hear more from Celia as well. And just to, to hear just going off of this, this um, conversation we're having about the future of cannabis and technology and then from your perspective, since you're, you know, you work with like an incubator of cannabis brands, and I'm sure there are a lot of people in this discussion that are maybe interested in launching their own brand one day, what advice you would have for them? Sure. So um, I think the, fu the future of cannabis is technology. Um, I think that's what we're seeing is that um, with things like 280E that crunch profits and the falling price of wholesale, which I know we touched on a little bit, cannabis companies are really, really tight. Um, and so you see, I, I mean, I guess maybe the first thing to talk about is the movement of the industry away from sort of small businesses and into the large multi-state operators, um, which is definitely a trend. And we could argue about pros and cons of that for sure, but that's what's happening. Um, and those companies are really leading the way in terms of technology. They're recognizing that they need to be able to produce a consistent quality that's replicable and that is um, able to be sort of um, projected, I guess is what I'm saying. So like being able to say, we know we're gonna be able to create this much. We know we're gonna be able to make this much money off of it. Um, and so technology is moving in that direction. So that means software systems that um, allow cultivators to control the environment better, able to track things better. So we put this much water and this much light into this plant, we got this kind of yield off of it. A um, lot of cool AI that's coming out around um, detecting disease, detecting yields. So being able to actually take pictures of plants and say, we expect X amount of pounds, um, which is really important for sort of forecasts um, and marketing purposes. So that's like on the cultivation side. Um, on the retail side and consumer education piece, um, there's always more point of sales popping up. There's always more loyalty programs popping up. The joke I think in cannabis tech is that there's not a single retailer out there who's happy with their point of sale system. Um, there's nobody that's cracked that code. Nobody's happy with it. Nobody's happy with tracking. Um, so BioTrack, um, MJ Freeway, Metric, like these are disaster systems for a lot of people. Um, they aren't necessarily consistent. Um, you know, MedMen, for example, lobbied the New York State to be able to not use BioTrack. So they actually built their own system because they didn't trust the third party technology. So um, there's a lot of opportunity. We say there's always room for better. Um, and that's what we like. We like to see companies that are doing better. Um, that being said, I think there's a lot of people who come from outside industry into cannabis and they try to 
apply something they've done in traditional industry to cannabis without really understanding all the ins and outs. And I would caution anyone against doing that. You really don't come in with your ego into this industry. You really need to come in humble. You need to ask people who've been here. You need to pay your dues, I think, in a way. I think there's a little bit of that that exists in this industry um, for sure. And, and they're different, especially when it comes to consumer education and the way consumers make choices in cannabis. It's not necessarily logical. Um, and so there's a lot um, that I think can be done around that. So I think that's the future of technology, um, at least on the sort of ancillary side. I think the only other, I agree with what everybody said about microdosing, that's definitely happening. The other trend seems to be in um, fast acting edibles. So that seems to be where we're moving in terms of a um, social consumption. So you go to a bar, you have a drink and you feel it within five minutes, not an hour and a half. Um, Cause who wants to sit in a loud bar not high for an hour and a half while you wait for it to kick in. Um, so that seems to be a, a, and we already see brands, 1906, Juana, there's a couple brands like that. They're already putting out fast acting products. Um, I think that's the future. So um, yeah, if you're if you're a cannabis company, and you're interested in launching a company, research, 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 get a really, really tight product market fit, fall in love with your customer, fall in love with the problem, create a solution people care about and listen to what they have to say about it. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. I am sure everyone is soaking that in because that was that was some good stuff right there. <laughs> um, well, I think that um, we're gonna move on to the Q and A right now. If anyone else wants to say anything or add anything um, before we do that, feel free. I just I just want to say I, I I feel like we should just do another panel on like each of the things we talked about because I, I have so much to talk about with each thing so maybe one day. John, <laughs> we'll just do more podcasts. Too. Oh yeah, that's right. We'll just have everyone <laughs> on our podcast. We we figured it out. <laughs> right. IG live takeovers. <laughs> The one thing I'll add really quick on platforms, just coming from having a retail and e-commerce in terms of POS systems um, and e-commerce platforms, to add to what Celia said, do your research. Um, I come from platforms. I did hosting platform management uh, for five plus years. It was very fun. Um, I use WordPress. WordPress is open source. If you can imagine closed source platforms, they own your content, um, which is great if you want something fast to spin up, but really bad if you post something that they don't like and then they pull your stuff down. So Shopify is a big offender in that regard. They've definitely opened up uh, publicly about uh, being CBD friendly. I call bullshit. Sorry on that one. I've talked to their team. I've talked to their lawyers on their team. They do not um, let you sell all CBD products. So um, to Celia's point again, do your research on what you want to sell and how you want to sell it. Because if you are a CBD topical company with no THC, that's a much different spin than if you're a smokable company with trace amounts of THC. Um, there's just a lot of different variations. Payment merchants, another one. You need to make sure your payment merchant knows what you're selling and integrates with your platform. If you do have questions about that and you would love a deep dive, I'm also available on Instagram because that's been my world for the past two years. Yeah, I'd second really doing your research because there's, I mean, a million ways you could go wrong and you're still going to go wrong a million ways even after you do your research. And so I wouldn't like get discouraged, um, but really just try and understand the industry, the players in the industry, try and get like some mentors, people that have already gone through what you're currently going through. Um, yeah, but don't get discouraged because you, you will um, go through some hard, hard stuff. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, so we're gonna pop on over to our Q&A. Um, so we'll just start with Michael Reedy. Um, they're asking, what are some technological hurdles for states that have either recently passed legalization or states that will legalize soon? I'm happy to jump in and talk about this. I think, um, for states that have legalized, I don't know if the technological hurdles are as big as the policy hurdles. Um, there's a lot of back and forth. So like 
Um, different states have done it differently, but states will come out and they'll be like, you can do anything. And then they'll be like, just kidding, you can't, you can only do this. And then they'll sort of loosen and tighten and loosen and tighten. And that seems to be the process um, for regulation. And then getting your tech to meet that, right, is problematic. So um, states, the big one is the seed to sale tracking system, right? So states bring those on. Um, it's not necessarily like, like Colorado uses metric. It's not the only thing available in Colorado, but it's the primary um, seed to sale tracking. I think that getting that set up and making sure that that's integrating well is important. States would be smart to talk to cannabis operators about what their experience has been with different technologies um, and bringing that in. I think Colorado has done a really good job of having working groups with actual cannabis operators um, that help make those decisions. So. Um, the next one is from Anonymous, um, and they're asking, how should we vet cannabis companies to either work for or invest in? It's a great question. I'd say culture, culture for working, for sure. Um, I read a book recently that was talking about how they, they measured um, how people how people choose employees, and most successful was cultural fit. So choosing employees based on a cultural fit um, had the longest term success. So being really tight on what your culture is as a company and if you're going to work for a company asking questions about what their culture is, I think is important. Um, when it comes to investing, I'm just going to go ahead and plug myself here. You can check out Canopy Boulder. <laughs> we have a great portfolio of companies. They've all been vetted. Um, so yeah. John, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, just to, I mean, she, she's, she's hit it on the dot there. But again, you know, it's good to know that like these companies are thinking long term. Um, again, I think there's a lot of companies that get into both cannabis and hemp space that really don't have any idea what they're getting into. Um, so it is good to have a company that has proper investment, um, who ha is thinking sustainable, who is thinking educational, who is thinking transparency, because um, that's the future of the industry. So um, that's at least what I would be looking for if I was, you know, looking for a job right now in the industry or looking to invest into a company. I'd add for like uh, companies that you're trying to work for, I think like you should decide whether you're trying to work for like, you know, plant touching job. Like, is that important to you versus like, uh, do you want to work for like an, an ancillary um, company that provides ancillary 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 services <laughs> to the cannabis industry. So that's like a good way to kind of like narrow down like where you're looking as well. And then for both like looking to work and also investing, I really think that you need to look at the people themselves, like especially, I mean, especially investing, like if you're investing in a company, like you need to be comfortable with the people that are leading that company and really understanding what their long-term vision is. Um, and then obviously people that know what they're doing, because there are a lot of people that are in the industry that, that really don't know what they're doing um, and they won't last long-term. So I think those are the two things that I look for or, and would recommend other people look for. Definitely agree with that. There's a lot of people in this industry that don't even consume cannabis and it kind of blows my mind sometimes. Um, so this question is from Savannah. They asked, are you worried about big pharma and their lobbying against legalization? I've heard mixed feelings in the biotech space. Great question. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, big pharma is just not, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be real, how many lives have they ruined? Um, you know, as much as they, they, I think they do good and help people in certain ways. Um, you know, I've lost maybe 20 friends the past 10 years to opiate addiction um, because of how monopolized and how corrupt uh, the big pharma industry is. Um, what really scares me about them getting involved is, again, all of the things I mentioned, you know, uh, sustainability practices, ethical uh, practices, how they treat their employees, the transparency, the quality of the medicine. Um, and, you know, it almost seems like big corporate or someone like Big Pharma comes in and all of a sudden, you know, um, we're back to consuming, you know, mid grades, which I think the government is using to do government testing with, and they're not even using the quality cannabis that we're all uh, consuming. So totally scared and, and uh, <laughs> 
definitely am trying to, you know, support organizations like NACB and other uh, organizations who are actually going to lobbyists and giving the industry a voice. Because um, right now is such a critical time for people who, you know, as Celia said, have put in their time. Um, you know, people have, I, I, I feel like I have myself and I don't even touch uh, what some others have done in this industry who are like my heroes in cannabis. Um, and those are really the people that I believe should have a voice in the future and what it looks like. Um, so, yeah, totally scared. I'm sure everyone else probably has feelings as well about it. So. I'd say um, one thing that's kind of interesting around big pharma is they're probably not going to touch it till it's federally legal. So um, I think sometimes we have this big thing about federal legalization being the answer. And I think what we saw happen when we legalized in the states is that we were more interested in legalization than we are were in how that's going to be rolled out. And so when we talk about federal legalization, we really need to talk about what that means at a federal level. That's why things like the MORE Act is really important because we're talking about social equity as we're talking about federal legalization. If we just legalize, this will just become another tool for capitalism. It'll just become another tool for people to make money off of and it'll lose what it is, which it has already, I think, started to do in some states. Um, so I think the focus, um, much like what the focus is in the psychedelics industry right now, should be around decriminalization um, and setting up an industry that can last long term. Hell yeah. I don't have anything else to add. I totally agree with both of you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um... Are any products mentioned tonight being sold in Massachusetts? I think we've got a couple here, maybe. Or, well, I think Kurt, Kurt, Corey and Shada's products, you can buy online anywhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you go to www.drinksuperhue, I can put that in the chat. Um, and I know we're also sending out a 20% off um, code for you guys. I can put that in the chat now as well. Why wait? Um, but yeah, you can buy them anywhere online. I just put it in the chat to restartcbd.com. We do ship nationwide. And if you ever are in Austin, Texas, you can come to my retail location, which is also available on social media and all those things. Awesome. You guys should definitely go order their products. Um, this question is from Leslie and they're asking, can you talk a little bit more about technology and products being developed to measure dosing, specifically targeting um, medical and older populations? Also a great question. There's stuff happening. There's definitely stuff happening. It's slow. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces, right? You, you've got to talk about the strength. I mean, you're talking about a plant, right? We're still for the most part, everything's being extracted from plants. We haven't started really down the um, synthetic cannabinoid path. Um, so getting that dosage rate is really gonna be dependent upon what's in the plant, how it's being consumed, is it oil? Um, you know, when we're talking about concentrates and oils, there's a little bit more room um, for dosing, but I think there are quite a few companies that have tried that. Um, Go Fire, I think is the one that comes to mind for me. They're Colorado based. Um, I don't think they're still operating. I'm not actually 100% sure. Um, because I think they just ran into just, it's, it's really hard. And when you're talking about medical dosing, you really need to be super precise. Um, and I, I don't know that anyone's quite cracked that code yet. There's a brand in California that I really love following um, called Dosist. And they have a disposable vaporizer um, that it's per dose. So it's, you know, whatever the equivalency of what a milligram is for a dose for them. So I believe it's like five milligrams. Um, it buzzes when you take the hit. So you know when to stop. They do a lot of good education around it. But that for me is like a piece of technology that I don't see a ton of other brands applying in the CBD space. I feel like um, 
I've heard of things like inhalers again, or sprays. They're obviously not super technological, but in terms of managing a dose, I think a little bit easier on a more rudimentary level. Um, again, this seems like it's common standards. It's not. Um, we use like uh, calibrated droppers for our CBD oil. So you can actually see the breakdown of what an ML is. It blows my mind, yet I still pick up national products and their droppers are blank. And it's like, where's the one ML line? I don't know. So I think little things like that can also help um, people just be more familiar with their products. I do, again, to plug myself, I do a lot of um, education on like reading labels and understanding like ingredients and dosing and figuring out the right dose for you. Another very simple, easy application um, that I've seen actually, I think um, Good Chemistry in Denver does it. They produce almost like a little dosing booklet. So again, going back to pen and paper, um, I think cannabis is so exploratory and so just kind of putting yourself in a position which you have to break the expectation or the uh, the desire of like, you go to the doctor, the doctor gives you a prescription. The prescription says like one pill, one time a day or drink with water, or not on an empty stomach. You have to kind of create a little bit of that um, instruction for yourself. And so I think CBD obviously is different than full THC. So kind of, you know, adjust accordingly, but documenting it, keeping track. I took this product. I took this many milligrams. It was an edible. I took it at 9 a.m. I didn't kick in until 10 a.m. You know, helps you just at least create a, a, a boundary for yourself. And I found that to be really successful with customers, especially um, older, older plus uh, customers too. I agree. There's, there's not enough uh, like products out there that are really doing the job of helping you guys dose properly and understand like how, how to have cannabis work for you. And it's a lot of trial and error, but I do know that there are a lot of can cannabis companies um, in the background working very diligently on technology and the way that they make their edibles to make them very consistent and make the dosing um, make the dosing very consistent because that's a, a problem in a lot of places especially new new states that have become rec um, the dosing isn't always correct um, but I know that people are working for it and I think it's up to the companies themselves to keep working toward that and also the consumer to like let them know that you know they're not doing enough for you and and almost like voting with your wallet right on like the companies that are doing that like buy those products i wholeheartedly agree yes big thumbs up there shada <laughs> um yes vote with your with your dollar buy from great brands i love all of this and Unfortunately, we are at time now. I wish that we could keep this discussion going because I have a feeling we could go all night. Um, but I will hand it back to Hannah. Thank you. I'm just going to put this back on the screen. So if anybody forgot to take a screenshot earlier, they can now get some giveaways going. Um, but oh, I think I just let me put it back on again give it another second. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists for being here tonight. You guys were so informative. I know that I learned a ton today, so I appreciate that. Um, and I think my colleague Emily is going to throw in a survey. So if you guys would like to tell us what you thought about tonight, um, feel free to toss that in. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email with this recording and some other resources and things like that. So um, we'll make sure that whatever our panelists mentioned tonight, uh, we will include in our follow-up email. But just wanted to say thank you and thank you everyone for being here. Have a thank good you. one. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.